Ah, here we are in Coronaville. This is Think Tech on a given Thursday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. And uh, we have Tim Apicella, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, as opposed to the other Cynthia Sinclairs around the world. There are so many. Uh, Stephanie Dalton and Winston Welsh. Hi, guys. Uh -huh. yeah. So the title of our show today here is uh, COVID is getting worse around the country. Um, and the implications are more dire now because uh, we, you know, we really don't have an immediate prospect of solution. And um, the way I put it is that, you know, does it really matter who wins the election? We have COVID. COVID is not going to go away. I mean, Joe Biden can make all the commissions he wants. There's a lot of work to be done to, uh, to deal with this disease, not only here, but around the world. And, you know, one thing is clear from, from the science, uh, the scientific people who appeared, you know, in the media is that you have to, you have to deal with it globally. You can't just deal with it one country at a time. And so there's a lot of work to be done. But bottom line is uh, Trump's legacy, win, lose, or draw, is COVID. He's, he's, uh, he, he owns it. And he, he leaves us with a legacy that is quite extraordinary, a legacy that has changed our lives. And I want to talk about that today. So the status of the matter right now, here on the very eve of the election, Tim, uh, you know, we're, we're only hours away. Uh, you know, we were... We were projecting earlier that he would do amazing, creative, you know, incredible things in the last few days before the election. I think the time is up. I think we're there already. And I think we're going to sail into this in, in a relatively subdued, you know, time of two or three days. The weekend doesn't count politically. Before you know it, the election. And so that legacy, where does he leave us? Can you give us a handle on, you know, the spread of it, the situation, you know, Wolf Blitzer and the situation, Tim, you look like Wolf Blitzer, uh, the situation around the world on COVID. What do we got here? Jay, he's left a legacy and where he's left us is a trail of death, literally 228,000 Americans. The number will grow. He's left our institutions weakened. He's left the employment sector horribly damaged, particularly the retail and all the restaurant sector horribly damaged. Um, he's left us with uh, strained strain relationships within the family units uh, just by being locked down for six months alone. Um, he has left a, a legacy of, of, of really death and, and destruction. And, and it's not to be taken lightly, but at the same time, you're right. Where do we, how do we move forward? And I don't know if you've ever been in a car that suddenly lost its brakes going downhill, but I have, and um, it's scary. And that's how I feel like we've been for the last six months with his direction under COVID. And um, Joe Biden, he may have a car that has brakes and he knows how to apply them as we're speeding down the hill with COVID. And I feel a lot more confident that Joe Biden has a plan. I think he'll implement a national policy of mass testing, contract test, you know, tracing, and I think he, he will get us on the right foot. And I think the economy will respond to that. We'll be able to interact with one another, uh, socially distance, of course, but we'll, we'll have an economy that still works. Now, you suggest that if Trump does win, he will carry on his, uh, quote, plan, which is really not a plan, uh, into the future. Have, have you got a, a ghost of Christmas future to talk to? I mean, what would happen if Trump won and continued his, his plan or non-plan about COVID? Sadly, Jay, 400,000 dead before we get a vaccine. That's, that's the bottom line as far as deaths. Um, I think the economy will be in a far greater shambles. Um, we can't keep you know, spending deficit dollars that we don't have to prop up the unemployed, to prop up uh, restaurants that aren't getting business, to prop up uh, the airline industries that you know, it's just now starting to get passengers. You can only spend trillions of dollars so much in the future. At some point, we'll go bankrupt. And uh, that can't continue forever. And so um, if Donald Trump continues as president, the economy will be in the, in the well, I can't say this word, uh, it'll be in the hole. And uh, we'll have a lot more deaths. And, and then we'll have something to really remember them by. Two terms of death, death and destruction. Yeah. Well, you know, even the plague back in the 14th century ultimately spent itself, not, not permanently, but uh, at least it, it got weaker over time. You know, I just want to make one point, you know, the, you know, the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union 
the you know the communism fell not because we are bright and smart we just outspent them they outspent themselves into oblivion with the military spending well this could be our our moment to, to outspend ourselves with covid yeah if we don't get a handle on it yeah yeah it really does affect the human race stephanie uh, you know to go to the question of the election um we don't know how you know how the votes are i mean there's a lot of polls and there's a lot of people telling us not to listen to the polls and there's a lot of speculation uh which i'm going to ask you to do uh, <laughs> about what people are going to do what they have done in mail voting um how do you think uh trump's non-plan has affected uh the election is it is it the single most important issue do you think it's turned a lot of voters away from him um or or have they learned pursuant to his messaging um from him that you know it, it really doesn't count that much do you think it's do you think it's the most profound issue in the election or or is it not i i personally think that it is but i don't know about the rest of the world i can only surmise that some are paying attention to his planfulness or not, and um uh, may not but i mean for example we've had what is it um uh 10 billion of taxpayer money invested in the operation warp uh warp speed to get the vaccine out and absolutely no no money no plan on how to get it to americans after it's prepared so this was in the washington post today that the the states are all saying the cdc is um coming out and asking them to be at the ready on November 15th to distribute. They're supposed to be at the ready and the states are coming back so we don't have the federal funds to do this or any other funds. So how are we supposed to do this? Well, I don't know. It's the same thing as selling the Brooklyn Bridge, isn't it? Yeah. So I mean there's no planning and this is my issue with Trump as to his competency. I mean the biggest in in issue is the president's capacity to manage the job, to solve the problems, to tackle the the threats, you know, all of this. And that's what where do we see any pattern of him being competent? Well, we do see a pattern. We see a pattern of people following him in a in a completely cynical process. Uh yeah. in, you know, in a Jim Jones of, you know, Guiana town um yeah. kind of process. And uh, we see government has changed. The way the the way the Congress operates has changed. The way the CDC has changed. I mean, we see we see he has legitimized lying, um, and this is this is not you know you cannot assume that's the end of it, uh, that with the end of Trump, hopefully that something coming soon, um, there won't be any more lying. Uh, he's legitimized it, and I think we'll see more of it. So my my question to you um, is, you know, how indeed how has this government changed around emergencies, around the perception of science? about uh, you know lying to people on things that may kill them how has this government changed and how permanent uh, has that change you know is that change going to be in our governmental you know system uh, probably uh, not too permanent because people are smart americans are smart and it was obama that was jumping around on the stage saying we lack what happened to the book? We left the book right up there on the table about how, how to do this whole thing. Where'd the book go? Anyway, I think we'll get the book back. And uh, once we have, other than an autocrat who's who's demanding that everything he says and does is followed to the letter, uh, we'll be back in the game again. Because, uh, you know, America's expertise is overwhelming. I mean, we've solved polio, we've solved uh, Ebon, Ebon, Ibana, Obama, <laughs> the Ibana. Stephanie, Stephanie, isn't there a breaking point? You know, the processes that Tim were, was talking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, are still in play. And no president, including Biden, can actually stop those processes on a dime. We have an econ economy that's in tatters. It's not likely to resurrect itself in 90 days. You know um, what? So, so, you know, query, you know, what what is the level of damage uh, to the economy, to the public, to the government as a consequence of what Trump has done. I, th I don't think it's going to be permanent because I feel that everybody is repressed. It's all being pushed down. This enormous energy that the United States has to help with it is going to just, just swell. 
It's going to swell. It's going to return. And Biden's going to. From your lips to God's ears. Uh, Cynthia, Cynthia, you know, uh, this yes. has affected the country. It has affected the culture of the country. It has affected the, the way groups uh, either, you know, unite or divide. Mostly in the Trump time, they have divided. We have found uh, flaws, perhaps fatal permanent flaws in the way the country works, the way the government relates to the people and the people relates to the government. Um, and uh, I, I just wonder, you know, if you could address the question of how the country and our individual lives, our culture as Americans has changed and whether those changes are long-term beyond this election. All right, I think that- uh, um, No, I'm asking, I'm asking Cynthia. Yeah, Cynthia. Um, that's a huge question. Um, and, and it's a hard now one- Now take two minutes. Yeah, well, it's a hard <laughs> one to really define. Um, because we thought racism was gone, right? We thought we elected a black president, so racism has finally been sent back home to stay. Yeah, well, obviously not. So how are we going to manage those kind of separations is, I think, the key to getting us back together. And every time I hear Joe Biden or Kamala Harris say they're going to be the president of all America, not just blue America, but all red and blue America and, you know, and independent too. And I love hearing that because it's that kind of inclusive messaging that is going to slowly bring us back. Can, can they pull it off, Cynthia? Can, can they pull it off? I mean, there are people in the country that blow that stuff off immediately and say, no, 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 I hate. I have lots of hate and, I, and, I, and I'm a skinhead and uh, I don't like this minority or that minority. Um, make me change. Are they going to change? Is Joe Biden going to do that? How do you do that? Well, that's the thing that's going to be so hard to define and whether or not they can. If he goes aggressively after all of these so-called militia, um, you know, goes after these white supremacists that are out there running around with their guns um, and, and actually prosecutes them, then I think we'll maybe take a couple steps further. But remember, I, I worked down in the South. I worked in Alabama for a long time. And these people whisper the N-word behind their hands when nobody's looking. And these are people that are now just have flourished because now they don't have to be ashamed of their racism. So how do we change the mentality so that they need to be ashamed of their racism? And I think that's the, gonna be the key. And so how do you do that and include them at the same time? It's gonna be a pretty- No, it's a, it's a key, but uh, you know, the, to me, these are, these are flaws that existed in the country maybe a long time. Oh, yeah. And uh, you can exacerbate them. He has exacerbated them. Uh, not only the social flaws, but the view of science, the view of disease, the view of public health, the view of um, you know, the, the government's relation to the people, it's uh, the government's um, you know, uh, uh, initiatives to help people and so forth. We've turned our back on all those values and there are people who agree with him. 40% of the country agrees. How do you, uh, it's rhetorical. I, I guess we agree that it's rhetorical. Maybe we'll cover it more you know, with Winston. Winston, my, my question, just slightly refined here, is, um, you know, uh, how, how, how long will it take for us to address this? And will we be able to do it in a safe way? I mean, starting with the fact that if Biden wins, there'll be violence. I mean, there's a fair chance the assault rifles will be out there. Um, and, you know, how are we going to handle that? And how are we going to get back to some level of civilized communal life in this nation? Uh, after this election next week? Uh, it's a great question. And it's one that's been uh, begging to be answered. Really, if you if you look at income inequality charts for, uh, you know, the last really three, four decades since, since, you know, the Reagan era came in and you're seeing now that uh, bubble down so that ordinary people with full-time jobs, two full-time jobs cannot pay their rent. Uh, this is what's fueling so much anger in the nation. Uh, People at the top ranks, whether, whether if you're making you know, $100 billion a year, should you be at a 22% maximum um, cap for your income? I think that's one thing uh, that 
we're not really aware of it. It's not in our face all the time, but it's about sort of paying your fair share. Um, that level of, of, of income equality and just the uh, circumstances in which people find themselves fuels all of this. So we have some very structural problems to, uh, to address after um, Biden and Harris take place. And again, it's malice towards none, charity towards all. We are in this with all of the people in the nation together. We have to find out what, how to address the real grievances. These other things are just smoke and, and mirrors and, uh, and noise. And that's what the, uh, Donald Trump is excellent at exploiting, saying, here's the people to blame. Uh, look at them as he's you know, manipulating the levers behind uh, the curtain. So as we go through, and you asked an important question, I think, uh, to Tim uh, or perhaps Stephanie about uh, the damage done to our institutions and how long that will take to recover. I think you, if you look back in the olden days and four years ago or eight years ago, and remember that the, I think it was in the, the Bush administration when the Surgeon General was prohibited from um, issuing anything uh, about gun violence in our nation that it, as a as a public health threat that they were it might have been a, a law passed by Congress uh, and and we thought that was so egregious that the Surgeon General could not address a public health concern. You look at the damage that has been done across the board in every single agency and it's not just reversing policies it's not just saying we should have a coal plant or not a coal plant. It's saying, if you do this, you'll be fired, you'll be marginalized, you'll be shamed nationally, you'll get death threats because you stood up for a position as a government worker. That is much harder to undo, and it makes people think twice about going into public service when you might be Gretchen um, uh, Whitmire, and is, uh, Whit, uh, what is Gretchen's last name in, in uh, uh, Michigan? And, and suddenly you want to be Whitmire, uh, Whitmire and, you, and you want to be a a public servant, but now you're facing this insanity. Um, we have a lot of, um, of backpedaling to do where we need to go deeply into our civic and nonprofit institutions and organizations to have a healing and a repair of this, of what's gone on. And it's going to have to, we really have to take a look at the whole thing from the, the 30,000 foot perspective. So that we can, and then we drill down from there and say, what are these issues that are, have fueled all of this? And of course, people are racist, they're sexist, they're homophobic, that's just how they are. But how do we, how do we say, hey, you know, folks, your neighbors aren't so different than you are, and, and do you really want to put them down? Um, no, we need to lift everybody up in this nation, and I think that's what we have a chance of doing if we do it right and we don't. Well, that's, that's the, the problem. With the, the devil's in the detail. You know, Tim, uh, in, you know, in his recent um, public statements, campaign statements, uh, Biden has said that in order to address, for example, the question of uh, packing the Supreme Court, which I think is an easy question, but that's just me, uh, easy, easy, easy. <laughs> I, I would pack it right away. He says, he, no, he wants, to, he wants to have a, you know, a commission, you know, create a commission, a bipartisan commission and study the problem. That, that sounds a lot like kicking it down the road um, and it sounds a lot like, uh, you know, trying to deflect any responsibility for it. And, and that's just one tiny example. So you also have, you know, the example of COVID. You have the example of public, uh, you know, of, of Obamacare and, and public health care initiatives. You have the example of the environment. I could go on. Um, how is Biden going to do that? Uh, you got to be pretty strong. And the buck has got to stop with you. And you can't have 27 commissions all around. Uh, reporting to you at convenience. So I'm, I'm going to make you, just for this show, um, a, member, <laughs> a member of Bi Biden's inner circle as the newly elected president. What do you tell him? How do you, you know, how does he actually do, you know, what Winston is saying? Well, okay, I don't like blue ribbon commissions because you're right. It's usually a symptom of kicking the can down the road but you're only as good as you are surrounding yourself with the best and brightest minds that have the nation's interest in mind, not sucking up to you as president of the United States. Um, Donald Trump was only I can fix it. And he, as we've talked many times, the sole proprietorship of government and, and the leader in running the government all by himself, that cannot be done. And, and in my mind, these institutions can be repaired. It's going to take the best and brightest experts to the table 
bipartisan experts to really come up and hammer out a solution. I think the first thing we have to look at, believe it or not, is education. We are in this mess because of 40 years of failed education to our public. Now, if you had the, 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 you know, the funds and the resources to send your children to a nice private school, wonderful. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't have, have those resources. So public education is job one to get us setting in the right direction. Then of course, you know, the Affordable Care Act needs to be hammered out a little bit better so that it's not gonna bankrupt the country, but at the same time, it's gonna get more people into the system. And we have to be able to do it without a, a Supreme Court challenge. Um, so there are institutions that can be repaired. It's gonna take folks on both sides of the red and blue divide to do so. Yeah, so uh, institutions, uh, problems we've found, um, you know, commissions or no commissions, maybe the buck just stops here with the new president. And uh, we'll be able to examine this going forward, you know, right after, you know, the next time we all meet will be after election day. I'm <laughs> really, so this is actually our, you know, our ninth inning here in terms of these shows, Trump week and uh, Coronaville. But uh, Stephanie, what are the priorities? If you're on that same, you know, board of advisors for the new president, what, what should he attack first and second and third? Because, you know, it's nice to have 27 things on your plate. But in, in a political world, in a, in a presidential, the world of presidential power, you really have to focus on things if you want people to follow you. What are the things that Biden should focus on first? Well, I think he'll have some relief uh, to, to, but to help him because I, I, I saw an article on what's gonna happen to Fox News if uh, Biden does win. So there'll be a little shift there um, in, the, in that kind of a blast out. Of course, there's other blasts coming out, but perhaps there can be some abatement in that kind of education that is going on in our country. And I think it's making a really big difference. And I guess that's under the rubric of, so me, it's media, not necessarily just social media, but certainly that uh, could could make a difference. I'd, and But as far as, um, the other influence, um, I just, we have to recall that, you know, we have a state's rights issue here versus the federal government. So even when it's getting to education, which thank you very much, um, Tim, is really, really important um, to, to do that. The feds only cover about 7% of that cost, but that makes a big difference if the feds would come up with the kind of, uh, uh, gift to education. So you're saying money, money, fiscal some... policy, tax policy is right at the top? Yes. Right, because for instance, like Bush for No Child Left Behind, the reasons No Child Left Behind is because that's the Elementary and Secondary Education Act name for him that he got a huge bush, bushel of money. Obama never got any money, which was why they were running around trying to make deals with the states all the time. So, I mean, there's some things about, you know, expediting the conveyance of you know, federal funds to what the targets must be according to our new president and his commission. So, I mean, there are many, many levers to start to pull and push to make this happen, but there yeah. has to be some learning on through and, bet, and take, taking advantage of that learning. So uh, Cynthia Lee, um, you know, I give you a situation. Let's assume Biden is successful, whether by commission or direct decision process and, and, he, and he respects science and at least medical science and he, and he finds that you can do this or that and you can, you can save the country and the world from COVID. Okay, and I don't know how fast uh, this can happen. Uh, I don't know how fast, ha how fast it would work once you know, he, he, he has a solution. Um, my question to you is you wake up one morning in the time of Biden and it's done. We are now out of COVID. We have seen the light at the end of the tunnel. And my question to you is, what, what is that like? How will your life change, the life of your neighbors, the life of the businesses that you deal with, um, your life in general? How would the life of all of us change? Will we simply go back to the way it was? I doubt that. How do you see our life at that point? I, I don't think we will go back to the way things were. I think that a lot of people have learned a lot of things about themselves, 
about each other, about the government. Things are different. We have more people being involved in politics right now with this election than we have in 25, 30 years. Um, so I think that's that alone will make a difference, right? And we've got some things that are gonna be coming out here though, going forward that are not part of a hypothetical. Um, it turns out that, that Trump has got his hands on $250 million to put out a COVID ad campaign that is specifically going to help his reelection saying he's done a good job. And um, they asked that Congress asked um, Azar for the paperwork about all of it and he refused to turn it over. So they dug and they went straight to the specific people and got some of those papers and, and were able to, um, they were um, interviewing uh, Representative uh, Christian Worthy this morning. And you know that money was des designated to educate America about COVID. It's not going to really do any of that. Um, apparently, it's all just a big ad campaign to help Trump. So yeah. people are going to be seeing this, and that's going to affect how we go from here. So to answer the, the final part of that question you asked me, is even if we open up and we find out that Biden's fixed everything and it's all good, we've still got all this time in between that's going to be polluting people's minds with who knows what. So it's so impossible to say, well, sure, we're gonna all learn and all go back to a better way of life. That's what we hope, that's what we want. But yeah. there's a lot of misinformation still being pumped right. into- Right, and, and it has, a, it has a, a life, a useful life that goes beyond the election. People, people's thinking is affected by all the lies that he's given. Uh, you know, for example, and, and Tim and I joke about this, there, a lot of people in this country still think that COVID is a, is a hoax. Right now, today, they still think it's a hoax. Um, Winston, let's, let's go to you for a minute. Um, you know, uh, I always say that the uh, most important thing about a democracy is that, that people have to see the government as belonging to them, the extension of them. And the government has to see itself as serving, you know, the, the public. One of the interesting things about Helsinki is uh, they call it cities as a service, C-A-A-S. And it, it demonstrates their dedication to serving the people who live in the city. And it takes all the politics out of it, actually. Um, and so maybe in this country, we ought to have government, you know, as a service to people, where people think the government is part of them, uh, and the government thinks that they work for the people. Um, wouldn't that be wonderful? And, and we, we have lost that. We, I think we started losing it when we lost the draft actually back in the, in the 70s. Uh, you know, national service has gone away. People do not connect. They do not feel connected with the government. Um, so my question to you is after this is over, we will need to re-examine the relationship of the citizen and the government, all citizens and the government. Um, how should we do that? And what's the desired result? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question, Jay. And uh, I remember when I went to Denmark uh, the first time and I was young and of course the first of the first world, right? Just, uh, 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 but they're a different population. They're, they're one peoples going together. And I was staying with a, an older couple that had been through the war and they said, oh, the government says this or that. And it, I can't remember what the specific was, but it was something that they completely knew that that was in their best interest, whatever the government action was. And I said, are you telling me you trust that your, the information your government is just sending you? And they said, of, of course. We are our government. Our government is us. They, they, they look out for us. They're doing the best for us. And the, as a young American, that sort of blew my mind because I think we've been taught from a young age to distrust the government on some level, to distrust um, institutions. And it's gotten way worse in the last 40 years. But at the same time, we're a, rule, we're a nation of rule of law. And so we can go back to that fundamental principle when we understand we begin to look at um, these whole systems, like you were saying, the city, the city in service. We need to look at that locally, on a state level, on a national level. I was thinking whoever the next mayor is of Honolulu, we, we institute um, 
you know, citizen strike teams where we go out and address citizen concerns, maybe based on city council uh, uh, zone, where they say, this is always a corner where trash is always there, or there's no curb cut, or we need trees here, or whatever it is. We need these, this trash bin's always overflowing, or what, whatever it is, so that we feel like we own this. But you're right, it has to start also with each of us, each of us getting invested in our own neighborhood, in our own um, districts, in our own uh, chosen um, organizations, whether they're religious or the, the Kiwanis or the, the, the Rotary or what, all of those things, and the, the PTA, the Boy Scouts, and then also being connected politically so that, so that we are the government and the government is us and we, we are listening to each other rather than just talking. And so I, I have faith in this nation that we will find the best answers. And once we remove once we move beyond what has been um, really just horrible for this nation, we're going to have a chance to come together. And I think Joe Biden's going to do it right. And I think that uh, we have to be thoughtful and careful about the way we do it so that we are inclusive of, of people and not, we're not talking the extreme and the lunatics. We're talking the huge majority of American people that say, I want a better future for myself, for my children and my nation. And this is a time for us to pull back look at where we've been going wrong, whether it's socially, politically, economically, environmentally, whatever it is, and we start taking the hard looks again and say, is this really serving all of us and our needs for the short, medium, and long term? And I think we have the chance to do that now. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time here. In fact, we are out of time, but hey. Uh, so Cynthia, one word that describes your summary of this discussion. I know that's not an easy question. See what you can do. One word. Give me a lot of time to think about it. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, antibodies is my word. Okay. <laughs> and the my word is because a UK study of 17,000 people found out that after three months, there's a 26% drop in antibodies. So just because people are infected and recover doesn't necessarily mean they're out of the woods forever. And so it, it means a lengthening, process, right? Right. Whole COVID. Uh, so, right. We still a lot we don't know. And if you confuse the people about science, then what you do know, you're not confident about. Stephanie, what's your, what's your take, your takeaway on this discussion? I would say prospects we see prospects i also wanted to sit to to laud uh uj and and winston for that way of thinking about uh, because we've got to get back to our representatives representing us i don't understand what anything in the senate has to do with any people that ever sent them there they've done absolutely nothing for people so i think the point I'm taking, it was Winston's beautiful municipal focus, but we've got the national government too to, to have to get those people to go back. If you don't do what you vote, what your people want you to do, then you got to go. That's yeah. what it's all about. Oh, uh, Tim, you know, can you be, uh, can you be optimistic? Uh, no. Level, uh, okay. <laughs> Tell us your no. thoughts about that. Uh, let me just say, I'm going to go opposite of you guys that are in the uh, ethereal here. And it is the responsibility of every citizen to question authority, Ben Franklin. And if you're a journalist, question authority always. Okay, yeah. that's beautiful, you guys, you're great. Uh, uh, Tim Apicella, uh, Stephanie Dalton, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, Winston Welsh, thank you for a wonderful discussion. And have a good time on election day and we'll see you the day after. Wow, exciting. Tim, you must be thinking about that all day and all night. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.